Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing and connecting the community to cultural events, artists, and classes at columbusarts.com. This time on Broad and High, we've got big bugs, pretty dresses. This is the dress that she was wearing when she was crowned Miss America. Angry stick figures and some hidden mothers. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi, I'm Audrey Hassan. Welcome to Broad and High. Big bugs have landed at the Franklin Park Conservatory for summer. With 25-foot long ants near the entrance and a towering 18-foot praying mantis in the courtyard, these insects are proof that this exhibit was aptly named. The praying mantis weighs close to 1,200 pounds. Uh, the ants behind me is close to 700 pounds overall weight. So the, uh, the Big Bugs exhibit has, there's, uh, I think we have 12 sculptures in total here. And the, uh, the sculpture exhibit is comprised of uh, different uh, subjects from the insect and arachnid world. And they're all made out of trees. They're super large scale, and they're made out of trees, different trees, different techniques. The praying mantis body by itself is 15 feet long. I'd been working uh, many years ago making rustic furniture. Uh, I was uh, visiting a cousin's property in, in Vermont and behind his house in a large open field was a bent over maple sapling that had been ravaged by a previous winter's ice storm. And I said to him, wow, doesn't that look like a, like a backbone to a dinosaur? And that was my first big branch sculpture and it changed everything. It was a big, big, you know, it was like an epiphany because I realized I've been working and being creative with branches and trees and saplings and, and constructing things, but it was all about form and function. You know, to get away from that and just to build things for the, for the fun of, 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 of building something that just is fun to look at. It's fun to build, fun to look at. And I was working on this giant dinosaur scale. So I thought, well, let's marry those two ideas together. And that was how Big Bugs were born, really. So the big bug sculptures are, you know, they're all made out of trees, different, different trees, different techniques. There's only four basic woods. There's black locust, black walnut, and red cedar. Those are the hardwoods that I use that I actually carve. And then uh, one of the other main materials in the exhibit are, are uh, willow saplings, which are individual uh, trees growing out of the ground, which uh, I go out and harvest myself. Also, I have the ants or willow. Um, the spiderweb is fabricated from willow. And then all the details on the dragonfly and damselfly wings is also willow. Because the willow is uh, so perishable and because it, it doesn't last very long, only you know, two to three years is about right, I've made in my, my career over the 22 years of big bugs 44 ants, which is 44 heads and 44 thoraxes and 44 abdomens. And then who can do six times 44 in their head really quick gets the door prize. I can't, but it's hundreds. Because it was a botanic garden and I was thinking about subject matter and I started thinking of the insect world and the incredible, more important role that they play in the garden. And I started referring to them as, as and still do, as the, as the hidden gardeners. And, and I didn't want anything to look creepy, but I also didn't want anything to look too cartoonish. But somehow I found that middle ground without really trying to, that, that they're not menacing. There's the, the play, the playfulness is, is just there. You know, to take these little tiny, seemingly insignificant animals and then put them on this like huge scale, this big role reversal thing happens. Because the show travels to all botanical and arboretums around the country, and because all of those institutions have a very uh, vital mission statement and they want to create a place 
for people to come and to, and to just enjoy the beauty of nature, but also understand how important it is to preserve it and protect it and to nurture it and be good stewards. And somehow that I get to play some small role in that mission, which is an amazing experience. Big Bugs will be on view at the Franklin Park Conservatory through September 27th. Visit fpconservatory.org to learn more. You might not expect to see beauty pageant gowns stored along with Civil War battle flags and quilts of rural Ohio in the state's historical archives. In 1963, Jackie Mayer of Sandusky was crowned Miss America, and she later donated her dress to the Ohio History Center. Curator Rebecca Odom showed me some of these contemporary artifacts of fashion. From Convention Hall in Atlantic City, the 1963 Miss America pageant. So this is the Jackie Mayer collection. Uh, Jackie Mayer's from Sandusky, Ohio, and she was Miss America for the year of 1963. So we have a lot of her gowns that she wore during her reign as Miss America, so when she was traveling throughout the country, as well as gowns that she wore in the pageant. This is the dress that she was wearing when she was crowned Miss America. And she actually was crowned in September of uh, 1962, uh, and then she served as Miss America for the year of 1963. Um, and it's a wedding dress. There's a petticoat that would have gone under it to make the skirt really puff out and look full. And uh, white was a great color for television because it really popped on black and white television. One of the really kind of neat things about this dress is that you'll see it's a little bit discolored under the arms because she was sweating on stage. And I think it's really neat to think about how um, even though she's Miss America and she's very poised and she's competing in this contest on national television, uh, she was still, you know, nervous and she was up on the stage and she was sweating. For anybody who maybe is a fan of like Miss Congeniality, um, this is the dressing gown that she wore behind the scenes as she changed, uh, changed her dresses for each aspect of the pageant and she gave us that as well, which is again something that we normally wouldn't find because most people wouldn't think to save their dressing gowns. So we're really glad to have, to have this piece as well. So this dress is from after Jackie won Miss America and you can see over here Yes, this is the dress that she's wearing in her official portrait. So this is a great combination of items to have in our collection. So we have this beautiful portrait of Jackie that was her official portrait. And then we have the dress that she was wearing when she sat for the portrait. Five Ohioans since 1923 have gone on to win the Miss America pageant. A new Miss Ohio will be crowned on June 20th in Mansfield. Visit MissOhio.org to learn more about this long-running scholarship program. Who will win the epic battle between a disgruntled stick figure and its human creator? In the fourth installment of his popular online animation series, Alan Becker fights to regain control over his computer. He shares with us how his film and figure both came to life. My name is Alan Becker. I graduated from CCAD. I'm from Columbus, Ohio, and I studied animation. Uh, when I was a junior in high school, I was playing around on my laptop. I uh, just discovered this cool animating program, and I made this uh, short and put it on the internet. It's called Animator vs. Animation, and it, it exploded on the internet. It gave rise to a second and a third one, and now just recently I finished a fourth one. So the animation takes place on a computer screen and it's kind of a battle between the person's mouse cursor and the little stick figure that he created. Uh, yeah, it's definitely a challenge to uh, put emotion in a faceless, uh, voiceless character. 
took me 11 months um, with 738 work hours. So before this uh, film was released, I had 30,000 subscribers on YouTube. Now I have 160,000. Since the second one was better than the first one, the third one was like way longer and bigger than the second one, and the fourth one was even bigger. Um, doing a number five, it would have to be maybe a feature film, but um, I'm planning to do short episodes. First one I'm actually working on right now is a uh, um, animator versus animation in, in Minecraft. Yeah? Could you come here for a second? Okay.
Talks. Check out Alan's YouTube channel to see his latest animation, where his stick figure takes on Minecraft. In the 19th century, when photography was still in its infancy, images had to be exposed for long periods before being captured on film, which meant subjects had to remain perfectly still to avoid a blurry photograph. And back then, children were just as squirmy as they are today. One way to help keep them still for the photo was the use of a hidden mother. 
Albert Ewing was born in 1870. He was born in Lowell, Ohio, which is in the southeastern part of the state. He became a photographer in 1896 and photographed until 1912. Hidden mothers, well, how would you, at that time, when you had to sit still for at least 15 seconds, record an image of a child? And if you moved, it would be blurry or you would just get a streak. Well, we're looking at a very scary American horror story <laughs> of a blanketed figure and three children. Really though, it is a mom under a blanket who's probably keeping her children calm. And you notice it's a dark material. So probably what he's going to do in the dark room, or what he did do, is make the entire background black. So all you would see is the kids. And then of course you crop out the legs. So if you go from say the shins up, you could actually um, see how you could create a nice little photograph of the three kids in that particular image without mom there. In the 1890s or the early 1900s was the first time that regular folks would be able to pay a quarter, a dime, or whatever it was to get a picture of each of their children. So in the early days, you see more family portraits. You don't really see pictures of individuals in the family. This was the first time where people could afford it. That's our show. To see more of today's stories, visit WOSU.org. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. And be sure to download the WOSU Public Media mobile app, where you can watch full episodes on your smartphone or tablet. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week on Broad and High. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing and connecting the community to cultural events, artists, and classes at columbusarts.com.